is over. Back to back shutouts for the Mets. They sweep a six game homestand, taking three from the Nationals. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Shea Station podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, you're probably confused because we don't know where Jerry is. He's in an airport waiting to get back home to Sweet Ohio. We'll throw it to him in a second because the Mets have just swept another series, two sweeps in a row, six wins in a row. Me and Jerry are television stars and we're prepping for the West Coast trip. Jerry, what the hell are you doing in an airport? I'm I'm taking the classic route from uh, LaGuardia to Detroit via Jacksonville. So right now I'm in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, I was on a flight last night that got canceled. Uh, had to stay overnight. My flight this morning got canceled. So you know, woe is me is not going to be my thing. Um, plenty of people going through harder things than I am, but just this is where I'm at right now, sitting on a floor in the corner of the Jacksonville airport uh, for my layover. But I'm here. The Mets just had an amazing. But first of all, if you could see me, forgive me for wearing the same outfit because I only packed for a couple of days. Um, thank goodness I brought my, my toothbrush and toothpaste. So that's nice. Uh, but the Mets home homestand, perfect six and oh, and it should have, you know, a couple of teams that they're better than, um, here comes the real test though. We're about to go back out to the West coast. This entire month of June is going to be against contending teams and the teams that aren't contending have great pitching like the, the Marlins. Um, so this is going to be a true test without, you know, DeGrom and Scherzer and McGill. We'll see if he comes around, but this is going to be, it's going to be a tough stretch. Yeah. I mean, at 35 and 17 and a 10 and a half game lead, the Mets have built themselves quite a nice cushion. Uh, I don't want to ever hear any of our audience members say that Jerry doesn't care about you. Uh, look at where he is. <laughs> He's in sitting in the corner wearing the same outfit from yesterday, a good outfit. Cause I love that JM Apple hoodie. Uh, guys, shop.jumboymedia.com. Come on, get on it. I have the white one and the black one as well, and they are fantastic. A little warm for Jacksonville, but thank goodness they have the AC running. Yeah, I don't think you were prepping for Jacksonville in the first place. <laughs> well, I was not. Uh, guys, I'm going to handle the recaps and the series problems. Yeah. So Jerry doesn't have to switch between screens on his iPhone. Um, I am going to say that game two is still technically mine. Oh, yeah. I, I know what happened. I get the W in my recaps. It was a 10 nothing game. Wonderful Trevor Williams. But you're going to handle all the details um, because I'm here on my phone. Yes, exactly. We don't want Jerry to have too much work while he's in this tough spot. All right, let's quickly run through it. It was a dominant series for our New York Mets in game one. It didn't look like things were going to go particularly well because we fell behind 3-0 very early in the first inning. David Peterson wasn't at his best in the start against the Nats. A two-run single by the rejuvenated Josh Bell and a Lane Thomas sacrifice fly made it a 30-pitch first inning for Peterson. But the Mets storm back like they always do with five runs in the first two innings off Eric Fetty, who's been arguably the best Nats starter this season. Three singles in a row by Guillaume, Starling Marte, and Francisco Lindor to start the game. A McNeil double play with the bases loaded uh, and nobody out brought in a run not what you wanted there Plummer doubled home Canna in his start in the second inning to tie the game Luis Guillaume had an RBI single to bring home Plummer for the 4-3 lead and then Starling Marte cranked a two-run homer to put the Mets ahead 5-3 as Fetty is pulled after just an inning and two-thirds the Mets continued the onslaught against the Nats bullpen Marte and Lindor notched RBI singles off Andres Machado in the fourth inning Nick Plummer put things out of reach with a three-run homer in the fifth 12 to 3 Mets are you kidding me Nick Plummer becomes the first Met in their entire franchise history to hit a home run in both of his first two starts Peterson he got yanked in the fifth wasn't his best stuff four and two-thirds four earned runs four walks we expect better from him next time around against the Dodgers the Mets bullpen carried the rest of the way Colin Holderman finally gave up his first earned run of the season but he was still solid Steven Nagosik tossed two more scoreless innings to put his total up to eight and two-thirds scoreless on the year and Pete Alonso added a garbage time home run to make it 13 to 5 which would be your final they did everything they could to get uh Peterson that win they wanted him they wanted him to finish the fifth inning uh let him drag it out a little bit he just didn't have it and I think they went to him in the right time bullpen looked great all series all homestand um 
just a cool Nick Plummer, you know, coming out party. Like that was fantastic. Uh, the Mario walkout song. Great. Get it. The plumber loved it. It's fantastic. Uh, just a really good showing, uh, in general from, you know, from the Mets offense and then the bullpen. So that was, uh, stellar game two. Gary, Gary had his line of, of course, a guy named plumber would be successful in flushing, which I thought was, you know, he had been holding <laughs> on to that one. I think. I, yeah, that's great. I didn't, I forgot about that line. So that's good. Gary, what a champ. I don't think he's holding on to that. I think a guy with that genius level, that's, that's spur of the moment. You're probably right. Uh, either way, either way. This would have been the maybe the best game two ever for you to recap, the most dominant game two victory of the season. I'm, I'm, I'm face palming, openly <laughs> face palming. But you take it. Yeah, Jeff McNeil returned to the field after DHing. He played left in this one, which is a really good sign after the wear and tear that kind of took him out of the lineup. The Mets got started early with a two run first, a leadoff Mark Canna single, and a Marte dead center two run homer. The fan made a great catch with a baby in hand. That was cool. Oh, catch. That's the catch of the year. <laughs> Uh, what happened next? Three consecutive third inning singles set up a Luis Guillaume two run single. That makes it four to nothing Mets. This would be all Trevor Williams needed and plenty because he was awesome this day. Five shutout innings, three hits, two walks, one strikeout on 80 pitches. His ERA is now down to 3.58. I think it's safe to say he has won that fifth starter job until Tyler McGill is back. So good for T Will. Uh, Patrick Corbin, who we've kind of hit around all season, he got chased in a four-run fifth inning that broke things open. Uh, McNeil, Eddie, and Tomas Nito, who we're going to talk about in a little bit, they all singled a base uh, to load the bases with one out. Mark Canna doubled home two runs. Lindor added a two-run single to make it 8-0. Uh, Eduardo Escobar smacked his third home run of the year from the right side of the plate, a two-run bound to make it 10-0. And the Mets' bullpen cruised once again in a blowout. Drew Smith, who I was shocked to see get five outs in this game. He returns from a dislocated pinky. He looked good. And then Joeli and Adonis Medina collected the final seven outs to seal another decisive win. Mets win this one 10 nothing. You got anything for me here? I do, yeah. Drew Smith coming back after the, the ugly, you know, comeback or that he, he stuck his mid out. Um, good to see him bounce back right away and get five outs. Shows you that uh, it's 100%. Just probably a little painful. Um Nito, unbelievable. Great job by, by Tomas Nito. Canna looked good in the leadoff spot. Uh, and then Marte's big home run. That was like out of, the, out of the second spot, out of the two spot to get that right off the bat. Beautiful thing. Uh, flexing those uh, muscles that he's got everywhere. Uh, good to see. Yeah, what did we say that his uh, his six pack has a six pack inside? Yeah, it? his his muscle. He's so he has so much muscle. His muscles have muscles. <laughs> like uh, he has muscles that he shouldn't have. Like I don't know. There's he's got a different set of genetics. I like to think that uh, he's like the like when you create a player and one of the MLB the show or NFL or whatever, and you just max out the muscle definition. Yeah, you know, it's like body fat is like negative eight percent. And then guess what, guys? I also have game three. I'm just, I'm being selfish today. You know, I can't yeah, even believe roll it. Roll with him. My <laughs> uh, we got Brandon Nimmo back in this one, which was awesome. Really, uh, that was good to see. Little, again, a little worried. I think he was out for five or six games. We finally get him back in the lineup. He batted the leadoff. Uh, the Mets are unable to crack rookie Evan Lee until the fourth inning. He looked pretty sharp in those first three innings. Me and Jerry were uh, front and center for this one. So we got to analyze him uh, at a very close view. Very fun time in that game. Uh, in the fourth inning, J.D. hit a single. Luis walked. He walked three times in this game. Uh, and then Tomas Nito. This became the Tomas Nito game. He singled them both home thanks to a center fielder error from D. Strange Gordon. That made it two to nothing. And Cookie Carrasco was ultimately solid even though he labored at times. Escaped a few hairy jams thanks to, surprisingly, some walks. Uh, he walked five guys in this game. He only had eight walks on the season in nine starts going into this one. So that was a bit peculiar. Uh, but five shutout innings for Cookie, four hits, five strikeouts, and 95 pitches. He strands eight men on base in this one. Uh, Nito and Marte singles set up an important insurance run via a Lindor sack fly in the seventh. That made it three to nothing, gave us a nice little cushion. But then Tomas broke it open in the eighth inning. Two run double for him. He had 
four hits on the night, a run, a double, and three RBI for Tomas in one of his best games ever uh, offensively. Seth Lugo had two scoreless innings. He was in and out really quickly. I think he only threw like 20 pitches. He was really efficient. Uh, Adam Adovino, he led on first and second. It was getting a little hairy, but then he gets three outs in a row to seal the eighth. And then just for fun, the Mets brought on Edwin Diaz. Uh, make sure he gets calibrated for that LA series because we're going to need him. He easily locks down the ninth. The Mets win 5 nothing. They sweep the Nats. They sweep a team they should sweep. They've won six in a row, and they have all the fat they need going into this West Coast trip. Very cool. Uh, incredible game. Um, awesome to be there with, with you and Audio Jack. It was so much fun. Uh, we didn't get to walk around quite as much as we wanted to. We had some, you know, some sponsorship obligations we had to do, which is cool. And we were there for um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I uh, wanted to to mingle. We got a lot of love for the Shea Station podcast, which was super cool, man. Yeah. It, it was fun to be like, hey, we love the pod. You know, it was nice. Um, I wanted to shout out quickly before we recap game three. I've been thinking about doing it the whole time. Linda Hughes on Twitter at Velcro baby, which is a great name. Uh, Thank you for your loyal following. You're always commenting. We appreciate you. Um, We've got some really cool loyal listeners. So I I just wanted to give Linda uh, a big shout out that she deserved. We've been trying to do it forever and it just keeps slipping our minds while we're, we're recapping and whatnot. Um, But man, what a game. It was awesome. It was good to see Nemo back. I think Lindor, what is it, like 10 games in a row that he's got an RBI? Something like that. Something crazy. Something, something crazy. Um, Cookie was was pitching uh, in front of his dad for the first yeah. time and some some type of crazy story. So that might have had his nerves a little bit. Uh, you know, just a, just an awesome game. Took advantage of some miscues by their team. We just did what good teams do. Yep. Um, Needle was fantastic. Uh, caught another shutout. Um, just a just a really cool game such a fun experience uh just being there just feels good um to to see a game from from that side i haven't been to a game as a fan you know i was still working but uh, i went to a game right after i retired and then this was it that was like a little bit of a whirlwind of emotions and now this was my first game just being a fan and it was awesome had a beer enjoyed the game had some good food it was great Everything you could want out of that experience, I think that we got a lot of, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like we're, we're, we're in a nice little bubble with our Shea Station pod. We have our dedicated listeners, but it was really cool to see just a lot of recognition for, you know, we're up to episode 71 now. We've been around for almost a year. It's really cool. It's just cool to see the uh, the progress. We got to hang out with Gelbsy, which was great. I love Steve, who's rocking his Rangers shoes, which uh, looks fly as hell. Uh, we actually got to uh, have a brief exchange with Cookie's dad, which was really cool. Uh, team translator, Alan Turiel, was there. Got to meet a lot of cool people yesterday. Audio Jack was long for the ride as well. Uh, we're missing him today because I'm at home. Yeah, it's my fault because because I, uh, I'm i not at home. I didn't get to make my flight. So we we you know we made a, an audible and here we are. Uh, Audio Jack is actually at home working hard on the vlog that's coming out from that day. So if you guys are curious to see what we were up to at the game, there's going to be a full... Uh, 10 to 12 minute vlog full of funny stuff and great stuff in there as well. Did is, was that your TV debut? That was my TV debut. Hey, if you guys <laughs> didn't see it, you can rewind it and whatever the case may be, go back through. Uh, Jolly gets a, gets a, you know, that beautiful smile front and center um, on the SNY broadcast, which was super cool. Yeah, it was, it was very, very cool. Uh, shout out to John DeMarsico. Also listen to the pod. He's the coordinator for SNY's video, and he uh, decided to get us on camera. Yeah, pretty cool. We appreciate them. Yeah, SNY, so they're classy, man. Um, happy to to work with both companies and to see the cohesiveness between the two because you know they could they could be you know bumping heads kind of thing. So it's nice to nice to see they understand both can exist. What a series! So uh, we're gonna do Apple of the Eye, Apple of Our Eye. You know? oh. That's right. So um, I'm going to go first because I can't look at the stats and I want you to be able to recap it. There was a couple of things that stood out to me. One being Starling Marte um, flashing some power. The other one being the bullpen as a whole, I thought of giving it to. Um, And then the guy I went with, the man of yesterday, consecutive scoreless, uh, consecutive shutouts. Tomas Nito is the apple of my eye. 
I think he's well deserved. Give a quick rundown. What were his what were his stats here? Yeah, so Tomas Nito, who I think flew under the radar uh, up until that last game where he obviously had an outburst. He went six for twelve, a double, three runs, three RBI, and he caught consecutive shutouts from you know a, a Trevor Williams start, and we expect good things from Tebow and Cookie, who didn't have his sharpest stuff. Tomas Nito was able to be the guiding hand in those in both those outings. Yeah. Um... Uh, a little fun fact on when you're pitching, especially in the minor leagues, and if you're a National League team, probably doesn't apply anymore. But if you got consecutive shutouts, you could take BP mm. as you know as young pitchers. So this is that would be the goal. We're like, all right, we got one. Let's do it again so we can hit BP on the field because it's way cooler than you know practicing pitching. Um, so I hope those guys get to hit a little bit of BP in LA. Probably won't. Doesn't isn't a thing anymore, uh, but uh, I thought that would be a fun little tidbit to add in. Oh, it definitely was. We love it. <laughs> Tomas Nito, great Apple winner there. Um, but as Jerry alluded to before, there's a ton of good choices here. Marte, you talked about five for 13, two homers, six RBIs. Lindor, five for 13, five more RBI and a stolen base to add to his little catalog of a season. Uh, Mark Canna had a four hit game in game two. He went six for 13, five runs for Canna, who was, you know, up and around the lineup. He did a really good job. Uh, Guillaume, four for 10, four walks, RBI, three runs. He does it all. Um, I think, uh, and oh, got a shout out to Nick Plummer too. Double home run, four RBI. He only got the one start, but he made the most of it because that's what Nick Plummer does. Um, but I think, I think mine is actually going to go to a pitcher, even though this was an offensive outburst uh, of a series. And I'm going to give mine to Trevor Williams uh, for his game two start. So a little claps for him. I'll do my finger claps because I'm holding the phone. <laughs> Uh, T-Will kind of got the short end of the stick. Uh, the Mets wanted to see what they had in Thomas Zipucky against San Francisco. We all know how that start went. We don't need to harp on it too much. Zipucky's a, a young kid. He'll figure it out. Uh, but Trevor Williams, you know, he, he took his hand. He took it in stride. He came in in that game. Uh, he had three and two-thirds innings of shutout relief. And uh, I think he proved to the Mets that uh, that is his fifth spot. Uh, I think when you have... Nine capable major league starters on your 40 man, even with the injuries in there. Uh, Trevor Williams is a nice guy to have at the back end. And uh, the Mets, you know, are always preparing for doomsday scenarios. And we lost Scherzer. We lost DeGrom. We lost McGill. We haven't had Lucchese. We haven't had Yamamoto. Trevor Williams is stepping into this fifth starter role that could have went to a lot of guys, and he's doing it in a very impressive fashion. Five shutout innings for him in game two. Uh, He made it look easy. Three hits, two walks, just the one strikeout. But when you're not a strikeout pitcher, the kind of team that you want to play for is the New York Mets because they play elite defense behind you, and that's exactly what they did, uh, yielding all those ground balls from Trevor Williams. He looks confident. He looks like uh, he feels like he belongs, which I think is really cool. Uh, And another stat I want to read uh, from Williams and Co., Trevor Williams, Colin Holderman, Steven Nagosik, and Jake Reed, four guys that are considered minor league depth for this team. They combined for a 1.60 ERA in 40 innings in May, and I think that goes a long way. It's going to go completely unsung because of how well the offense is doing, Uh, but the fact that uh, the Mets pitching coach, Jeremy Hefner, and the entire coaching staff is able to enrich this minor league talent and make it major league talent speaks volumes to, I think, the, uh, the difference that is the 2020. 22 Mets compared to other years. So Trevor Williams gets my apple. Congratulations. Well-deserved, man. Um, I'm still not completely convinced sure. that this is his fifth spot. And not just because he doesn't deserve it. I, I, they probably do give it to him, but I'm still of the thought process that he's too valuable in the bullpen mm. because you don't want to, you don't want to tire those guys out. You don't want to, especially during this long stretch, you don't want to wear out the back end of your bullpen any more than you have to. And Trevor Williams allows them to kind of give them a, a breather. I would still, you know, like to see Zapucky, although if he can't get, <laughs> if he can't get a, a, another couple of innings out of him, Trevor Williams is going to pitch in that game either way. Um, so I'm not sure, but he definitely deserved it, man. It was such a, an important lockdown five innings you know we didn't get that from peterson we didn't get it from zapucky so it was important especially you know with the rotation coming up uh, for him to log those innings he well deserved absolutely so i mean when tyler mcgill comes back it'll likely be t will going back to the bullpen which only strengthens this team i know that t will wants to start he's stated as such um but when you play for a competitive team you just got to fill your role and do it the best that you can 
Yeah, um, he's a very capable starter coming up with the Pirates. He was kind of on that high trajectory. I think he just had a down year and then got moved to a team that, that put him in there. So he's very, very capable. Um, he's also a good Twitter follow. So I think his name is uh, Mayamo Trevor. Yes. Uh, definitely fun follow. So if you're if you're not following him, go ahead and give him one. Absolutely. Can't recommend that enough. Good call, by the way. Nice. I forgot. Hey, thanks. Yeah. Again, I'm not. I'm pulling this from straight from memory because I'm just staring, staring at that wonderful, wonderful face of yours, that fantastic <laughs> goatee. Yeah, uh, Mets did a lot of great things in May uh, for sure. The uh, sec- the two highest RBI totals in May in Mets history were both set in this month. Uh, Pete Alonso with 30, Francisco Lindor with 28. Those are one and two in Mets history. Uh, A couple other things. Mets bullpen only allowed one earned run in 12 and a third innings this series. Uh, The Mets lead MLB with nine shutouts on the year. None of them are from Max Scherzer starts, which is pretty interesting. So even with Scherzer gone, the shutouts continue. Uh, The Mets have the third biggest division lead in MLB history on June 1st ever. Uh, 11 games was the 2017 Astros. 14 games was the 2001 Mariners. Ten and a half is the 2022 Mets. Uh, Luis Guillorme, he finished May with a 414 batting average. He's the first Met ever to hit over 400 in a month since Wilson Ramos in August of 2019. And the Mets have set a club record for runs scored in May with 158. Just an absolutely incredible month from our New York Mets. Francisco Lindor won NL Player of the Week. Uh, I want to take a break from all these amazing things because I want you specifically to talk about uh, some news that came to light before this series started after the conclusion of the last series, which is the Mets' decision to option Dom Smith to AAA, which kind of got lost in the scuffle of another sweep. Yeah, I think it's um, – yeah, obviously this isn't ideal for the player or the team. Um, he, wasn't, he wasn't succeeding. He wasn't having success. And he's got options. And he's still valuable, so the team wants to hold on to him. And he needs every day at bats. He's shown that that he needs consistent at bats to be, you know, to have a productive, you know, chunk of the season. He's a starter, so coming off the bench wasn't going well for him. The success he has had was in 2020 when he was an everyday player. Um, so the team did what they had to do, and they moved him, you know, to AAA. Obviously, not great. Um, for anybody, nobody wanted to see that, but it is what it is. It's part of the game. We've all been there. Well, most of us that have played have been optioned down. There's a few guys like, uh, you know, David Wright, Jacob DeGrom that never go back once they, they get a taste. But for the most of us, um, you use all of your options and, and they're there for a reason. Teams have them. They're usually for development purposes and, and team control, but um I have no doubt that Dom Smith will be back in the big leagues, whether it's, you know, in a Mets uniform when the rosters expand or if something happens and they need them uh, or with another team. But um, I wish him nothing but success. And and that's what uh, he needs to go down and get right. Yeah, I I agree with everything you said. I I think that it's an important signifier of two things. One, that Dom needs a reset. And I think that Dom knows that as well as tough of a pill as that is to swallow And that, too, uh, these Mets are not messing around. Uh, They shed a a very expensive contract that uh, freed up a roster spot. They weren't afraid to cut ties with that money. Um, And Nick Plummer, who had an outstanding four days in the big leagues, uh, has earned his right to stay at the big leagues and see what and the Mets want to see what he has. And I really respect that because they easily could have sent him back down uh, to respect Dom because Dom's been with the club since 2017. But they made the hard decision. I'll tell you what, though, I, I really like what I see out of Nick Plummer. He's yeah. got a really short, pretty swing. Um, I don't want to bring a name into it, but it's a very similar swing to Michael Conforto. Yeah. Um, a very repeatable, successful type of swing. This guy, I've never heard of him before. We picked him up. Just a testament to, again, I'm not a, I'm not a prospect kind of guy. Um, in the pandemic, uh, really kind of messed with a lot of progress for guys. But what a find, Billy Epler and, and the scouting department. Well, incredible, man. He just looks the part. Yeah. So, you know, I, I bet he is, you know, just so relieved to, to see his dreams come true. And, and he looks like he can have success at this level. So what a find. Yeah. I mean, plucked from the Cardinals farm system. They gave him up. Uh, this was Epler's first move 
coming into the Mets GM role uh, before the Scherzer, before the the trio of position player signings, it was scouting wow. minor league depth, and it was Nick Plummer, yeah. and it's uh, it's it's blossoming now, which is really really cool to see. So the like, I just want to add a little bit. Like you see a guy come up like this. Um, when a guy comes up, it's a great story. But at, on the other end of it, you see somebody else's dream get a bump in the road like Dom. Um, um, so there's always give and take on, on everything. Baseball is a tough game. You know, you're always, there's always somebody trying to take your job. So you're constantly under pressure, constantly having to perform, um, especially when you have options or you're not a high salary guy. The teams are, are more willing to move you around. So that's, that's a little bit of the human side of, of being an athlete on that kind of level. Um, but it's great for Plummer. Uh, super happy for him. It's just such a fun story to, to see guys come up. They've been doing a really good job of highlighting some of the young guys coming up uh, just in general from MLB uh, across the board. You get to see a lot of the stories. Um, but Plummer's a fun one, man, and he really looks like a superstar possibility. Um, obviously the, the power is there and it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's, it's very cool to see. I, it's just nice that the Mets are able to get as much as they possibly can out of, you know, the guys that are considered depth at this point. And obviously you're never going to have a season where everyone stays healthy the full time and plays to their utmost potential. And who, who's to say he's not a, just a depth spot. He could be, you know, he could be a superstar. I mean, Luis Guillerme was just a, a glove first guy and he's, starting to blossom you know we don't know who he is completely as a player but until proven otherwise he is a fantastic offensive player as well so um your story is never written man you're always the author of your own story people can can like us me and you can say a narrative that you're this guy you're a depth piece or you're a swing man in the bullpen Trevor Williams could turn out to be an all-star you know starter who knows the it's out there given an opportunity, everybody has a chance to step up. So, um, you know, baseball is an amazing sport and we get to see some really cool things. And I hope Nick Plummer turns out to be this perennial all-star. That'd be just fantastic. And again, if you're, you're a Mets follower, you gotta love it. Yeah. And I mean, the team that we're about to play the Dodgers, uh, this is what they do. I mean, they plucked Justin Turner off waivers and they turned him into a multi-time all-star. They traded scraps. They traded scraps for Max Muncy. They traded scraps for Chris Taylor. Both those guys signed huge deals to stay with that team. They signed Tyler Anderson to a one-year, I think, $3 million deal, and he leads the NL in ERA, or he's up there at 2.90. I mean, the, the list goes on for that team and what they're able to do in terms of enriching talent. And that is the formula you want to follow if you want to have long-term sustained success. Uh, Plummer and T-Will are just the first inklings of this, but there could be plenty more uh, in the Mets' future if, if they continue to follow this formula. Cool, man. You want to do uh, some previews? Yeah, man. Let's talk about this Mets-Dodgers series. All right. Let's talk about it. All right. I'm going to rip through these four games. It is a four-game set. Uh, Mets fans, prepare. And playing tonight. No no off season or no off day on this travel. So yes, we play tonight, which is insane. Uh, three 10 p.m. starts. The last one is 4 p.m. The Mets play tonight. There's no rest for these guys, but they're coming in hot, which is good. And the Dodgers are coming in quite cold, just getting swept by the Pirates. They lost the season series two to five there, so that's a little bit uncharacteristic of them. Uh, hopefully, we can pounce on their slow momentum with our high momentum. Uh, game one is sure to be a good one. Taiwan Walker and his sparkling, as you would say, 2.83 ERA against Tony Gonsolin, who has been the NL ERA leader this year at 1.80. So that's a tough matchup for our Mets. Uh, Eddie is 5 for 13 with two home runs and six RBI against Gonsolin. So look out for him. No other Met has recorded a hit against Tony Gonsolin. So that'll be a tough one. And Gonsolin has not allowed more than two earned run in a game started this year, but he also hasn't gone over six innings pitched. So we likely will see a decent bit of the Dodgers bullpen in this first First game. Game two is going to be Chris Bassett with his 3.66 mark against Tyler Anderson, who I mentioned before, 2.90 there. Uh, most Dodgers hitters have not seen Bassett at all. Edwin Rios is the only one with some success. He's two for three with a home run. Brandon Nimmo, three for six with a home run against Tyler Anderson. Ba uh, Bassett had a huge start last time out, really bounced back and proved that he could be the ace of this staff right now. Six innings, one earned run, two hits, three walks, seven strikeouts. Tyler Anderson, a little bit spooky here, has a 20-inning scoreless streak going in from his last three starts heading into game two here. 
Game three, David Peterson, big start for him uh, to bounce back. He has a 3.03 mark against Walker Bueller, the ace of the staff at a 3.22 mark for him. Most Dodgers hitters have not seen David Peterson, which could be an advantage. Freddie Freeman's three for 10, but that's about it. Uh, Pete Alonso is four for 12 with three homers and six RBI against Walker Bueller. That's a pretty good stat line there. Uh, David Peterson just had his worst outing of the year, 4.2 innings, four and runs, six hits, four walks, one strikeout. We'll need him to bounce back and be himself. But Walker Bueller didn't really have a good May. His last four games started a 5.32 ERA and a 303 batting average against. So we're kind of getting the weaker view, uh, version of Bueller. Hopefully he doesn't bounce back against us. We can keep him on that slow tide. And then game four, the guy we've talked about a lot this episode, Trevor Williams and his 3.58 ERA goes up against Julio Urias and his 2.89 mark. Uh, Williams last five outings, 20 in the third innings, 1.77 ERA, 181 batting average against. The only thing that's really hurting T-Will in the recent Govit has been his walk, so if he has his control, he should be good. Uh, Urias had an inconsistent May. He surrendered four in it, uh, four earned runs in six innings to Pittsburgh in his last start. He usually only goes about five to six innings, so we'll get the Dodgers bullpen in this one. Uh, Williams has a 6.14 ERA in 22 career innings against the Dodgers, and Urias has allowed seven earned runs in nine career innings against the Mets. Four highly touted matchups between the two best teams in the National League. This is going to be a defining series for how the Mets will go in June because they have San Diego and the Angels right after this. But this would be a great way to kick off the month. Uh, I mean, I said it before. I think I would be very, very happy if the Mets just went 500 five and five on this 10 game gauntlet. But the way that they've played, uh, I would not be shocked to see them do better than that. Yeah, the goal is to go 500 on the road, you know, from a big league club win at home, win every series at home, and then split on the road. That's the success to winning your division. Um, like I said, this is a tough month. Every team we're going to play is going to come, you know, either a contender or have great pitching, uh, building for a contender. A couple of things that I'm really looking forward to in this first series, Chris Bassett. The, the Dodgers are known for their approach from the offensive side. They really understand what you're trying to do as a pitcher, and they'll – like look for a damage spot on things that you like to do and they'll wait for it. Bassett's a hard guy to prepare for because of his pitches, how he throws that he's kind of unpredictable. So that should be an interesting matchup. Plus Bassett had a good outing, but not a great one. He got into trouble, walked the bases low to get out of it. Still looking for him to truly blossom um, and really, really step up against, you know, the best team in, in baseball outside of New York. Um, then you David, David Peterson looking to bounce back. We're going to need him. He's uh, looking to solidify, again, his presence in that rotation. He's here to stay for, for a couple of starts, but it'd be nice for confidence for him to, to have a good, you know, just a quality outing, five, six innings, two, three runs, something like that. Uh, and then I'm really, really hoping that uh, Eddie Escobar has just an amazing road trip, something that he could build up off of. He hasn't been terrible, hasn't been great. Um, to see him in, a, in the series against Philly and have that walk-off hit and his emotion, it'd be nice to, for him to have some sustained success, not have to really ride those highs and lows. Uh, so I'm looking for him. And then, of course, Pete Alonso uh, to drive in some runs and see if Francisco Lindor, I'm pretty sure he still has this amazing RBI streak. I, I'm not sure we covered it. So hopefully he keeps that going as well. Yeah, I mean, the Mets lineup is hot right now outside of pretty much only Eddie Escobar. Even Tomas Nito had that four hit game yesterday. So if he gets it clicking, uh, there is no breathing room in this Mets lineup whatsoever. Uh, and one thing I saw from Tim Healy, uh, he tweeted this out. Uh, that uh, the Dodgers broadcast after they got swept uh, said that it's not going to get any easier for this team. They have the Mets coming in. And I think it's very it's a cool thing for Mets fans to hear because our mindset is, okay, shit, we got to go play four in L.A. against the Dodgers. But I'm pretty sure Dodgers fans are thinking, shit, we got to go play the Mets for four now, and they're the hottest team in baseball. Uh, we should feel like we're a titan of the National League right now, and we can take on anybody. I know that uh, we're used to feeling the fear, especially from last year, for a West Coast trip where we had, you know, 13 games against the Dodgers and Giants that basically ended our season. Uh, now we have 10 in a row against three great teams, all different, all good at different things. Um, but I'm pretty sure they're just as afraid of us as we might be of them. So hang your hat high. The, the pressures are definitely on on the Dodgers, especially because – they just got swept by the Pirates. They're coming home. Did, were they were they in Pittsburgh? No, they were in L.A. They got swept at home. So they're definitely looking to kind of bounce back. 
And the Mets don't have to do anything special. They just need to play Mets brand of baseball. Uh, so the pressure's definitely on the Dodgers, which is pretty cool. Like you said, um, we are in such a good position schedule wise. Uh, this is again, tough, but we've built up, you know, the largest lead in May. I think you wrote something in the notes like forever. I don't know what the, but we have 10 and a half game lead in history. <laughs> it's, it's wild. So you don't have to, you don't have to panic. You just want to play competitive. And the Mets way of baseball right now is legitimately be competitive in every at bat, every pitch. So it's a setup for success. This will be a gauntlet. This is the first test. Um, but I expect good things. Yeah. And I mean, the Dodgers are very similar to us in the fact that they are leaning on their depth pieces right now. They've lost Tommy Canely, Blake Trinan, Andrew Heaney, Clayton Kershaw, Max Muncy. I mean, just a laundry list of talent that they would normally be using every day is not with the roster right now. Still a very good roster and one to be afraid of. Their lineup, there is no breathing room, and Mookie Betts already has 16 home runs on the year. Yeah. It's not going to be easy, plain and simple. Yeah, so on our side, I was looking for Escobar. Uh, On their side, my preseason MVP pick was Mookie Betts. He looks every bit the part. Uh, You know, people forget how great he is. And Freddie Freeman is the other guy in that lineup. You know, it's going to be weird to see him in in the Dodger blue. Um, we know what he can do against the Mets. He's going to look to to kind of push that. Um, but those are the two guys in their lineup. They 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 have a deep team. We all know what the Dodgers are are as an organization. So, but uh, those are the two guys that I am making sure do not beat us. Yeah, I definitely agree. And Jerry, I think you made it through your airport Shea oh Station episode. I did it. I was lonely over here, you know, by myself. And now there's a bunch of people sitting around. I'm very self-conscious about talking to my phone really loudly. I have the, the like the noise canceling on my headphones. So I have no idea how loud I've been, but uh, I'll awkwardly walk. I'll awkwardly walk back to my gate. <laughs> Anyone just giving you the side eye? Like, what is that guy doing? Ah, I'll just keep my head down. All right, perfect. All right, guys. Uh, thank you for bearing with us. Apologies for the short episode, but we didn't want to make Jerry linger too long uh, with his airport debacle. We will be back on Monday to talk about the four-game set with the Dodgers. I'll be back in studio. Jerry will be back at home, hopefully. I don't know if you you might. Yeah, we'll see. I'll, I'll keep you updated. Yeah. Uh, but thank you guys so much for uh, an incredible experience yesterday at the game. Thank you for listening, as always. Oh, yes. We love you. We got to meet some really cool fans of the podcast, which is you know, like, a, it's really fun. Like, I can't say how much, you know, I meant to, to you and I both and Audio Jack, just how cool it is to say, yeah, we love the podcast, love what you guys are doing. Gelbs was like, oh, I can't wait to meet Jolly. Uh, will you get a picture with me? He was so pumped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was just, it was a... Uh... It was hard to uh, fulfill the uh, content requirement that we had at that game because we were just having so much fun meeting everybody and yep. watching the game and taking it all in. So hopefully we'll yeah, get to do that really again cool. soon. Yeah. Uh, so right. let's go Mets. We're out of here. Huh? Out of let's here. go Mets. Guys, stay tuned. Uh, stay up. Get yourself some sleep. <laughs> <laughs>